In June 1983 in Houston, Texas, two people were brutally butchered with a pickaxe. This is the kind of grisly double murder that would dominate the headlines any day of the week. But this crime captured more attention than usual because the killer was a five foot three, 121 pound woman. Her brutal slayings and her subsequent reformation as a born again Christian divided a nation when it came to her fate. This is what happens when rehabilitation isn't an option. Welcome back to my channel. Today's case is one of those that may divide opinion. I'm gonna be really interested in your comments. See how you feel at the end of this one. Also, big shout out to all of you who are returning to my channel every single week. I could not do this without you. Big thanks to my Patreon and YouTube membership. Literally can't make this content without you. So you are appreciated. If you are new here and you're wondering what's she going on about, I release my crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday religiously. Crime and consistency is my theme and literally it really is my theme every wednesday every sunday if you do fancy subscribing why don't you get your notifications on as well so you never miss an episode like i said today's case i think it's going to leave some of you a little bit conflicted if you don't know this case strap in if you do, hopefully by the end of it you'll know a little bit more than you originally considered that you did let's start so Let's go back to 1983. Ronald Reagan is president at the time. The Mario Brothers arcade game hits the street of Japan in this year. Motorola, would you believe, introduced the first mobile phones. And in Houston, Texas, a double murder was committed that still ranks as one of the most grisliest killings in that city, even four decades later. The monstrosity of the crime genuinely has stood the test of time. So on the 13th of June, 1983, that morning, Gregory Scott Traver knocks on the door of his friend, Jerry Lynn Dean. This is in Northeast Houston. They basically live very close to one another. They even work in the same place. Jerry tended to give Gregory a lift to work every morning, but for some reason that particular morning, Jerry hadn't turned up. So Gregory had therefore walked the short distance to Jerry's, obviously hoping that he hadn't left and he could still catch his lift. Now, when he gets to his friends, he sees that the door is just slightly ajar. So instinctively, he just calls out Jerry's name, but there isn't any response. So Gregory decides that he's gonna enter the apartment. After all, the good friends, no big deal if he walks in. And also he just gets that feeling that he wants to check that Jerry's okay. Now instantly, he catches sight of the fact that things have been moved. So the stereo, the TV, they've been taken down, they've been stacked together. Also instantly recognizes that the motorcycle Jerry was building in the front room isn't there. So he's starting to anticipate that something could have gone wrong. Maybe there's been a home invasion. Who knows? There could even be people still in the residence. But certainly it's disconcerting for Gregory. And then he goes and looks for his friend. So he goes from room to room. And then eventually he reaches a spare bedroom. And nothing could have prepared him for what he was about to see. He was greeted with a scene from a nightmare. So Jerry is lying on the floor. He's got blood surrounding his head and there's a body of a young woman just lay nearby on the bed. Gregory actually didn't recognize who this woman was, but what he saw was that she had a three foot long pickaxe embedded in her chest. Imagine the psychology of Gregory. He's gone round to check on his friend who usually picks him up. Obviously, this is distinct from the normal kind of habits that occur. He's not turned up that morning, so he's therefore gone and done what any good mate would do. He's checked on his friend, and nothing could have prepared him for what he was going to see. This is brutal slaying of two individuals 
one of those individuals being a very good friend of his. So he obviously immediately alerts the authorities, the police are on the scene very quickly and they're able to establish that the two victims are 27 year old former cable installer Jerry Lindeen, who's a mechanic by trade, and 32 year old office worker Deborah Ruth Thornton. Now Deborah, she was a wife, she was a mother, she had a really young daughter and basically she had had a scenario unfold where she and her husband had had a big argument the previous day and she'd stormed off. She'd then gone to a bar, she'd met Jerry later that day and that's how she'd ended up going back to his. I mean when we talk about sliding doors moments, you literally have a row with your husband, you end up going to cool off, you meet some guy, hang out with them, go back to his house, and then you end up with a three foot pickaxe literally stuck in your body. I mean, how on earth can people wrap their heads around that scenario playing out if they're related to you? This one decision totally transforms the future of everybody that you know and love. So as far as she's concerned, it was without a doubt the wrong time, wrong place scenario. So there's a murder investigation launched immediately and the police's job is to hunt for suspects and find out what predators have carried out this gruesome attack. They want to also know what was the motive? What on earth kind of provoked this situation to a point where people have felt comfortable murdering these individuals in this horrific and violent and tortuous way? The investigators initially anticipate that it's likely to do with a robbery. So basically they came in to take items from the home and potentially that's gone wrong. Not sure whether you guys agree with me. Personally, I don't see a lot of home invasions ending up in double homicide. It does happen, but on the occasions that those things happen, it doesn't tend to involve things like a three foot pickaxe and it tends to not seem as intimate because there is an intimacy about the murders that we're gonna talk about. There is a violence and an aggression and rage that feels like it has to be actually directed because of some feelings that the predator, the killer, is wanting to exhibit to the person that they're murdering. They're actually giving them a message as they kill them. It's not just about snuffing out their life, it's about snuffing out their life in a way that ensures the person being murdered knows the rage carried within the individual who killed them. So initially though, that's what they go for. It's a robbery, it's gone wrong, and basically a big motivation they thought is that Jerry's been in the process of building this motorbike, which is a custom Harley Davidson. That had been taken, so understandably that had been removed from the scene, and also his blue Chevrolet El Camino pickup was also taken from the scene. They also noted that both of the victims' wallets were missing. But that still doesn't make it your typical home invasion. So first of all, there was actually no sign of a forced entry, which you would imagine would have occurred if strangers were entering the building. So the door had either been unlocked or the perpetrators had been invited in, or alternatively, they had a key. So essentially they let themselves in off the street. And one of the things that the investigators noticed as well was that the spare room kind of looked like more of a storage room. So there were boxes of materials stacked up, there were loads of dirty clothes, and there were also various garden tools, and Jerry's toolbox was there as well. And so it seemed that the perpetrators had actually taken advantage of those tools, so that's what they'd used in the attack. And of course, we know that one of those items was a pickaxe, because that was still embedded in Deborah's heart. And also there was a hammer, and that was near Jerry's body. Now, both of the bodies had actually been stabbed repeatedly with the pickaxe, which must have just been the most painful and suffering of deaths. And they also noted that Jerry had suffered some serious blunt force trauma to his head. And it was clear as far as they could tell that his neck had actually been broken. Now, for the first few weeks of the investigation, the police really didn't pick up any leads, which was very frustrating. But this changes in week five, when homicide detective JC Mosier receives a call. And this caller is a longtime friend of his, a guy called Doug McAndrew Garrett. 
Now, Doug asked if he could meet him the next day. And when he meets Doug, Doug's with his girlfriend, Carrie Burrell. And out of nowhere, they claim that they know exactly who was responsible for the double murder. They said it was Doug's brother, 37-year-old Danny Ryan Garrett, and his girlfriend, who was Carrie's sister. That's 23-year-old Carla Faye Tucker. Now, they also alleged that the couple's friend, James Liebrandt, had also been present during the killings. Now, Doug and Carrie, they go ahead and explain that they had literally been told step by step exactly what had happened by the perpetrators themselves. So both Tucker and Garrett had basically just bragged about it. They were really proud of what they had done to those two poor victims. Now, clearly, what shall we say? It's like the best gift ever, isn't it, for the investigators? You've got two people telling you that not only do they know who the perpetrators are, they have a step-by-step -step guide as to how the murders played out. Absolute game changer for the investigation. But the police know that they're still going to need evidence, otherwise it's hearsay. You know, people can say anybody's responsible for something, but that doesn't actually legitimately mean that they are guilty. So Doug agrees to wear a wire because he's going to attempt to get a recorded confession from Tucker and Garrett. So two days later, he went to the house where the pair had, until very recently, lived with his girlfriend, Carrie. This is on McKean Street, Houston. What could we say? about Tucker and Garrett. Well, they weren't shrinking violets regarding withholding information. No, they were just happy to talk through exactly what they did. There was no persuasion required. They actually spoke about the murders for over an hour and they went into great detail. They really vividly described exactly what they'd done to Jerry and to Deborah. And what is really disturbing on so many levels that I don't believe there are enough levels to describe. I think that it would be infinity levels because it just keeps going with the levels regarding how wrong it is what I'm about to tell you. And yet this was actually said. So Tucker said that she had orgasmed with each blow of the pickaxe. I feel a little bit dirty saying that. I'm not going to lie. Makes me feel a little bit stained. But what could we say? It's a very odd paraphernalia, isn't it? One where you are sexually titillated by stabbing somebody with a pickaxe. I mean, we know it happens. You think about somebody like Joanna Dennehy, a serial killer that was around in the UK and serving a full life sentence in the UK today. She similarly had a paraphernalia where she used to really enjoy being harmed and harming others to get sexual gratification. So we do see these odd fetishes, but certainly what I'm describing is dire when she actually felt that she reached climax when she is ending the life of these two innocent people. So the police have, shall we say, more than they need. I don't think they needed all that. I think just describing the murders would have been fine. But again, we're seeing the mindset of this particular murderer, the fact that she has no remorse, she's very callous, she enjoyed the experience, she felt gratified by the actual murder. She felt that every blow of that pickaxe gratified her and helped her to reach that climax. So at this point, obviously, they arrest and charge them both with murder. Lee Brandt's also implicated in the conversation, so he ends up getting arrested the same day. Also, along with Ronnie Burrell, that's Carrie's ex-husband. So now the investigation's gone from having no idea, no leads, to suddenly having the main culprit under arrest. Now, from the investigation that followed, the police basically start to build up a picture of the events that led up to the brutal murders. So it transpires that Tucker, she disliked Jerry, and she disliked Jerry for quite a long time, and there were lots of different reasons for that. She basically disliked him initially from the start because he starts dating her best friend, Sean Johnson. Now, I think we can all agree that we've all been in relationships with friends and they've met somebody that we don't like, and they do annoying things like forget to call us, 
they get to meet up with us regularly, just disappear off the face of the earth for a long period of time because they're engaged elsewhere. It's frustrating, it's annoying, and obviously that does not ingratiate their new partner to you as being one of their friends and feeling abandoned by the relationship and blaming the new partner for that. So I understand at the end of the day, Tucker starts to form that almost instant dislike. However, another reason that she dislikes him is because Tucker and Sean were actually sharing a house at the time and Jerry moves in. Again, total empathy and sympathy for any of you who've been in a situation where you're renting a place with somebody and then they just bring a new partner into the scene and you're like, I don't know them and I don't think I like them and now they're living with me. It's frustrating. That, I believe, is something she has a right to feel. And also, once he arrives, he kind of breaches a few boundaries that are probably not acceptable or appropriate. So she comes in one day and he's parked his leaking motorcycle in her living room. I mean, with respect, that's going to annoy anyone with a brain. Why is your bike in my living room, leaking all over my carpet. That's gonna really, really offend you. So again, this incites this frustration and it adds to this sense of not liking him. Now, when she goes and kicks him out, and again, I feel at this point, we all have to agree that there are reasons potentially for kicking him out. He then retaliates by defacing her photo albums, which is not acceptable. And one of the things that he defaces is the only photograph she actually had with her mother. So this is really solidifying this disdain that Tucker feels towards him. And apparently it's at this point Tucker starts to express a desire to certain people to off Jerry and to steal his motorbike. And the reason that she wants to steal his motorcycle is she wants to build one of her own. And during her previous wild prostitution days, that's a quote, by the way, it's not me saying that she had wild prostitution days, that's a quote. But basically, in these wild prostitution days, she'd ridden one. So she wants to reclaim some of that past. When I've looked at Tucker, wow, she had a really troubled upbringing. This is not me trying to create a motivation to excuse any of her actions at all. I'm just saying that we always look at the ingredients list of possibility. We always try to figure out how the hell does someone end up like this? How does somebody's mindset change to a position where they're willing to murder? I think it's really important to look at the pen portrait of possibility that creates these killers. And she really did have a troubled upbringing. So she was born on 18th of November, 1959 in Houston, Texas. She was the youngest of three sisters. Her father, Larry, well, he wasn't really a permanent feature in her life growing up, so there were attachment issues there. He came in and out of her life. And he and her mother, Caroline, they finally divorced when she's 10 years of age. But there's been a lot of dysfunction there. There's been problematic relational experience, and certainly that's not ideal for a child at all. And there've been several separations earlier to them actually getting divorced. So it was quite chaotic regarding being brought up by those particular people. Also, it's during that time, she finds out that she wasn't actually her father's daughter. In fact, she's the result of a mother's extramarital affair. And that's a real breach of trust. You know, you're being brought up by this guy. You're probably idolizing him no matter how inconsistent the care is, no matter how often he leaves. The logistics are, it's your person, it's who you belong to, and then suddenly you realise it's not, and that this guy isn't even biologically related to you. She'd really wondered as well during her childhood why she looked so different to her blue-eyed and blonde-haired sisters. So she felt there was a very distinct reality between her siblings and herself. So it transpires that Caroline had actually frequently cheated on Larry. And that's difficult as well, because clearly some people do have extramarital affairs and they do have babies that don't biologically belong to their partners. But usually that person will know exactly who the baby belongs to because it was an extramarital affair. It can be more concerning and challenging if a parent has multiple partners and therefore you don't actually even know who your father is. So 
you can automatically see the dysfunction playing out here. And again, not just dysfunction, but a lack of foundation in her experience as a daughter. And Tucker was actually encouraged bizarrely into prostitution as a young teenager by her mother. I kid you not, by her mother. Now, I know that we've all probably been in situations where parents encourage us into jobs. When I was 11, I started my first paper round. At 13, I had a job in a shop. At 15, with respect, I was working 37 hours a week, which is why often I didn't go to school. I was knackered. But what I'm saying is, you encourage your kids to have a worth about money and a worth about the impact they can have on the world. You do not, however, encourage them to make money by turning tricks as a kid. She's a kid when she's encouraging her to do this. Her mother is basically pimping out her child. Also, she encouraged her to take drugs. I know what you're thinking. Her mother, Caroline, sounds like the perfect kind of parent that we could all aspire to be like. Seriously, if you could write down worst parent possible on paper, I'm describing it right now, right? So of course, because her mum's saying that she should do these things, and bear in mind, we often want to do what our parents tell us, because they've got our best interests at heart, they know what we need, then she's following down this terrifying road. And also encouraging her to take drugs is a really good idea as far as it goes, because if you think about the fact that she's probably gonna be looking for an escape, an antidote to the emotional dysfunction and emotional dysregulation that's caused by being put in a position where she's having to sell her body, she's gonna be looking to just alleviate that pain. So this is the perfect storm now. We have a young teenager who's been encouraged, but I believe forced into prostitution. And now she's basically a chronic drug user. She was literally a chronic abuser of drugs so early on that it's actually horrifying. She begins smoking marijuana when she's eight years of age. And actually she was doing that with her sisters because you know what, Caroline, the mum, she got them all involved. She was injecting heroin at 10 years of age, 10 years of age. Can you imagine the level of dysfunction we are describing right now? She's 10 and she's jacking up heroin, all encouraged by her family. Now it's later established that in her entire life, when she was a free person, she'd been off drugs for two weeks only. So from eight onwards, there were just two solitary weeks where she wasn't absolutely smashed and high. She was having sex at the age of 12 and she was prostituting herself at the age of 14. She was essentially sexually exploited. We can use the word prostituting, that's what the literature refers to it to regarding this particular case, but it's not. It's sex trafficking minors under the watch of her mother she was sexually exploited. I'm saying that because it's almost easier to disassociate from the woman that I'm talking about today because of how heinous the crimes are. And if we use the word prostitute, it suggests an election of choice. It makes you think, well, at the end of the day, she wanted to sell her body. Therefore, we don't really need to feel empathy or sympathy for her at all. But if we say instead that she was sexually exploited, as a child, well, it's a very different mindset that comes to mind and we automatically and rightfully feel incredibly sorry for her and her situation. Now, because of her complete dysfunction, because of how radically departed the life she was living was from what it should have been, she ends up only completing seven years of education during her entire lifetime. She dropped out of school, understandably, and while she did work for a very short period of time, in an office, she didn't maintain any long periods of employment. And again, when you've not had a great education, when you've been so messed up by drugs and by being sex trafficked, then understandably school didn't necessarily have a place in your world because of the chaos that was around it. Now she briefly marries a mechanic, Stephen Griffith. Now this is when she's 16 years of age. Kind of makes sense if you think about all the instability, the idea of committing to a relationship and being with somebody who can potentially become a protector 
that would be an alluring experience. But unfortunately, if you haven't got the foundations and the capacity because you've had such chaos in your world, committing in that way can be quite challenging. And also, are you really picking the right kind of person when you're 16 years of age and you've been that badly abused? This turns out to be a really short, volatile relationship. And later on, she ends up becoming a rock band groupie, just like her mother. Again, Caroline, she is not exactly the kind of person that you would wish to have in any child's life, but she's emulating her mother. She's following in her footsteps. She travels with various groups. This includes the Eagles. It actually is one of those odd things that has changed with time. Back in the 60s and 70s, being a groupie with a rock band, it was kind of something that people revered, people were quite proud of. There were incredibly young girls having sex with older guys. It's massively offensive to me that you look back now and think about how abused these kids were because they felt that they were doing something cool, having sex with these older guys who are basically just using them at every different pit stop. These days, we see things very, very differently, but obviously back then it was far more normalized. She led this really dysfunctional lifestyle, fueled by drugs, fueled by alcohol, and at times financed by sex work. So she's lived a very chaotic, dysfunctional 20 years by this point. And there isn't really a period of time with stability or safety. And that's going to obviously impact your psychology and your emotional experience of the world. And also the way that you view other people within that world. And even if you think that you're electing to be somebody who's happy to give their body for money, often it creates an internal rage. You might not be processing it, but the self-loathing it can create, it can manifest and it can grow and it can fester and it can be something that becomes unmanageable and intolerable, and in turn, it can become dangerous. Let's think about somebody like Eileen Wernos, who was an individual who killed seven men, and again, a lot of the feelings that she, shall we say, projected onto those individuals came from a sense of hating the human race and the rage that she felt because she'd essentially been used by men for such a long time that she really didn't see them of having any value. So we get to her early 20s. This is when she starts hanging out with bikers and this is when she actually became friends with Sean. Sean then later marries Jerry Lynn Dean and Sean, her best friend, she introduces her to Danny Garrett in 1981. So at this point, Tucker's 21, Garrett's 35, big difference in age. At 35, you've done a lot more, you've experienced a lot more, there's a power dynamic that goes on because obviously you are a bit more worldly wise. On a positive level, if you have someone who's chaotic and dysfunctional, actually that can, in certain circumstances, mean that you bring a maturity to the relationship that they sorely need. Now the pair, they hit it off, they really do. And they end up moving in pretty quickly. Unfortunately, this isn't gonna be a relationship marked by stability because they both have a really great love of drugs and partying. So it's a recipe for disaster, basically. What I would say is, despite her wild, in inverted commas, background, at this point, Tucker has never, ever been convicted of any kind of offence. But she did have, historically, a reputation for being violent. So when she was 14, she had attacked and beaten up a classmate, and it was quite a severe attack. She'd left her with two black eyes. And when she was 15, she got into a fight with a man and a woman. That's right, a man and a woman. So on boundaries, she isn't thinking about personal safety in that moment, is she? Because physically, men are stronger than us. Even a guy who's smaller than you tends to be dominant when it comes down to being violent against a woman. They're going to win. Simple as that. So she doesn't see those boundaries. She's obviously quite happy putting herself at risk and also believes that she's handy enough to take on a guy. The relationship with Stephen is turbulent. And even the violence that I've just talked about within those other fights, that actually becomes part of their relationship. So they have many fist fights. That's literally how it's recognized, that they would get into fist fights 
And he actually said, he was quoted as saying that no man had ever hit him as hard as she did. So she was somebody who was quite confident in the way that she fought. She was also highly aggressive and she didn't limit herself. And took her later down the line, she claimed that she'd had at least three good fights where someone had got hurt. On one occasion, she'd even punched Jerry in the face. Now we all know that she didn't like Jerry, but this is when he defaced those photos, the one including her and her mum that she felt really angry about. And she hit him so hard that the blow had broken his glasses and then he'd actually needed to go to hospital because he'd got glass from the glasses in his eye. So she is tough and she is low boundary orientated when it comes to violence and she is somebody who can do quite a lot of damage. She has a confidence in her aggression. Now, Tucker says that during this period of time, she was basically hanging out with a tough crowd and that she really wanted to impress them. I think that's something we could all agree is quite common. You have a group of mates, you want to belong to that group of mates, you certainly don't want to be an outlier, you act in accordance with the way that they act, but you still always have a choice. You know, no matter how much you want to hang out with those friends, it doesn't mean that you have to beat people up so that you seem to fit in better than you would if you, I don't know, just thought maybe we'll go for a beer. Maybe we'll have a nice meal around at mine. They're all things that still mean that you can connect without causing anyone serious injury. Just throwing it out there, Tucker. Just throwing it out as a, another possibility. So we get to the day before the murder. This is the 12th of June, 1983. Carrie and her ex-husband, Ronnie, and James Labron, they've spent the afternoon with Tucker and her boyfriend, Garrett, at their house. Basically, they got absolutely wasted. So they're drinking, they're smoking weed, they're taking lots of pills, they're taking speed. That is a heady mix of particular drugs that can certainly impact on the way that we act, obviously. Goes without saying, that is gonna incite potential emotions that you don't want inciting. Certainly things like pills and speed together, it can cause some quite chaotic thinking and chaotic actions. And the reason they've been getting that high was basically they've been celebrating Carrie's birthday. Now, during the previous two days, according to Tucker, in her own words, she said that she had been wired. And when I tell you what she had been taking, I'm not sure the word wired is an appropriate definition. I don't know how she was alive. I genuinely mean that. I do not know how she was alive. The constitution she must have had to survive the level of drugs in her system, I just can't compute it. So in those last few days, she'd been taking heroin, Valium, Placidil, Percodon, Soma, Wygesic, Dilaudid, and Methamphetamine. I know, you can add to that alcohol as well. It's insane. How she was breathing, I don't know. Now, Carrie and Ronnie, they essentially, after them all getting wasted, they leave separately later that evening. And then we get to the early hours of the following morning. So we've got Tucker, Garrett, and Liebrandt. And they've obviously been talking. They've obviously been putting their thoughts together about Jerry and all their feelings towards Jerry. And so they decide that they're gonna pay Jerry a visit. Now, the plan, apparently, was just to intimidate him. And the reason that they wanted to go around and intimidate him is they said that Tucker and Garrett were owed money by him. So basically they were gonna go around, get it back, and they were gonna steal his motorcycle. Not quite sure how they feel justified in going around and getting apparently the money that's owed to them back, but also stealing the motorbike. That seems like then he's gonna be owed something by them. I don't know, make it make sense, it doesn't make sense. But this is what their excuses for going around. And in case there was trouble, Garrett decided that he'd take his shotgun along. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think taking a shotgun along is a good idea 
because essentially it could mean that you're going to blow somebody into pieces and a preventable method for not letting that happen when you're about to go to home and invade somebody and try to steal their bike is by leaving your shotgun elsewhere. But again, the reason that I'm bringing that up is because if you're taking a shotgun around to a home that you're about to remove property from that isn't yours, clearly you're expecting there might be a problem and more importantly, it suggests that you're willing to act on that problem and in this case, potentially use a shotgun to eradicate said problem. Whether the plan was actually genuinely to rob Jerry, we'll never know. But what I will tell you is things escalated very, very quickly. It spiraled completely out of control into what can only be described as an orgy of violence that had been fueled by drugs and alcohol. So the group arrive at Jerry's apartment. It's around 3 a.m. at this point. Lybrun actually remains outside and he goes and looks for Jerry's pickup. Now, unknown to Jerry, Tucker had actually got a key to his apartment, which is why when the investigators arrived at the scene, it didn't look like anybody had broken in. And they didn't because Tucker literally opened the door because she had that key. She'd stolen it from her best friend, Jerry's estranged wife, Sean. That in itself shows you that she was always, in my view, preparing for an opportunity to go to Jerry's and to use that key. Why else would you have taken it? She even convinced Sean that she lost it. So this is enough within her mind to create an opportunity for her to enter his home and property at some point should she choose to. So how long she'd been planning to do something terrible to Jerry, we don't know but it's enough for her to have actually got that key and convinced Sean that she'd lost it herself. So she's very manipulative in that moment. Now it turned out that the reason that Sean and Jerry weren't together was because Jerry had actually assaulted her and it was a horrible assault. So I understand why Sean wasn't with him. He'd broken a nose, he'd busted a lip. And this again is another reason why Tucker feels very angry with him. So she's legitimately in her mind feeling that there's a need for retribution. Her best friend has been horribly assaulted by somebody who's meant to have loved and protected her. But again, if you are looking to do something negative to another human being, you're constantly seeking something that supports the bias. And in this case, Sean's assault is definitely supporting that bias. But again, it doesn't lend itself to an understanding as to why Tucker had taken that key and manipulated her friend to believe that she'd simply lost it so she could have access when she chose to get into Jerry's home. So she unlocks the door, she goes inside with Garrett and this is when they go and find Jerry asleep in the spare bedroom. Tucker turns the light on. Jerry obviously awakes and immediately begins to sit up. At this point, she just jumps on him. She straddles him and she says, don't move motherfucker or you're dead. Now Jerry instinctively grabs Tucker's arms above her elbows because clearly he's gonna try to manipulate her off him. But Garrett at this point just intervenes and wow, what an escalation of an intervention. He basically strikes Jerry repeatedly round the back of the head with a hammer. He's found that hammer on the floor. And at this point, Jerry's just begging for his life. He knows something horrific is playing out and he just wants to understand what's happening and he's just begging for them to stop. Now, ultimately, Jerry is left really critically injured and he's actually on the floor and he's making these really awful gurgling sounds. Now, the reason why he was making those gurgly sounds was because the blows that Garrett had inflicted on him with the hammer had actually caused his head to become unhinged from his neck. So his lungs were basically filling with blood. The response from Tucker to these noises is she's annoyed by the sound that he's making. So she looks around, she looks at the various tools in the room and then she spots a three foot pickaxe leaning against the wall. So she grabs it and then she just begins to repeatedly stab him all over his body. After every blow, allegedly she looked up and she grinned. Now whilst this is playing out, 
Garrett is carrying the motorcycle parts outside. So this man is being mutilated and murdered and all he's thinking about is removing the motorcycle parts so they can take them with them. He'd also at this point brought Lybrand in. So he'd been outside in the car, he'd been asleep and you can understand what he felt when he walks into the spare room. He's absolutely horrified, mortified, terrified. He wasn't a part of this. He didn't want this to play out. He didn't know they were going to kill this guy. He thinks they're there to remove some property. And he said that he literally heard what he later described as sounding like a broken aquarium pump. And that was actually Jerry's gurgling death rattles. And then he saw Tucker. And Tucker's actually struggling at this point to pull a pickaxe from Jerry's body. And then when she finally is able to manipulate it out of his body, when she manages it to tear it loose, she literally looks around, smiles at Lybrand, and then slams the pickaxe back down. He was so horrified, he just ran from that apartment on foot. And he later gets picked up by Carrie's ex-husband, Ronnie Burrell. Meanwhile, Garrett delivered the final blow with the pickaxe to Jerry's chest. So both of those individuals have caused his death. Now after Jerry is dead, Garrett notices that there's a woman hiding against the wall under the bed covers. A woman that they didn't recognise. This is Deborah Thornton. Can you imagine the terror that Deborah must have felt? The day before, she'd just stormed off. She'd had an argument with her husband. She meets the man at a bar. She goes home with him and then in the middle of the night two strangers appear in the room and proceed to butcher him in front of her with a hammer and a pickaxe. Now in that moment she must have thought this is going to go very badly for me and she was absolutely right because Tucker decided that there was absolutely no way they could leave a witness which is ironic because one of the people that they had gone there with had ran off literally horrified so there's a witness on the loose anyway so i don't believe for one minute that tucker felt that they couldn't leave that witness i believe that she just wanted to kill somebody else she was arguing basically that the lights had been on so deborah had seen the faces also they'd basically mentioned one another's names several times so deborah bear in mind she's on the bed she's shaking in fear Tucker throws a sheet back over her and says to her, you stay under there if you want to live. But that's absolutely a ruse. It's a lie. So she then just starts to repeatedly strike her with the pickaxe. And Deborah is screaming in agony. And bear in mind, guys, the ending of Deborah's life, it was not a quick affair. At one point, it got so bad and Deborah had been so critically injured and it was so much pain that she's literally pleading with them to just kill her. She's saying she can't take it anymore. In response to that, Garrett kicks her under the chin, threw her back onto the mattress and sunk the pickaxe right down into her throat. Can you imagine the moments of that poor woman's murder? The horror, the pain, the pleading to die and then meeting her end that way. Just absolutely horrific. The autopsies, they later established the extent of the violence inflicted on both of the victims. So Jerry, he'd been struck with a pickaxe 28 times. It was actually really difficult for them when they did an autopsy to figure out what had actually been the fatal blow. They determined there were 20 potentially fatal injuries. So the cause of death itself had been a combination of severe head trauma, which had involved a fractured skull and also stab wounds. Deborah, meanwhile, well, she'd been struck with the pickaxe actually a similar number of times to Jerry. And she died from those multiple stab wounds to the chest and also the stab wounds and blunt trauma to the back that she experienced. And of course, the final blow that had struck her heart and that was actually where the pickaxe had actually been left embedded. Oh, that poor woman. I mean, both of them totally innocent and finding themselves tortured and brutalized and murdered in this way. Now, after going through with the killing of Jerry and Deborah, Tucker and Garrett go ahead and complete the robbery, 
part of the plan. So they loaded Jerry's partially built motorcycle into the back of the pickup and then they drove to Doug's apartment. Doug was Garrett's brother. This is around 6.30 a.m. And it's here that Doug first learns what Tucker and Garrett had done to Jerry. In fact, Tucker happily announced that they'd offed Jerry Dean last night. Said, Dan hit him with the hammer and I picked him. And basically then she went on to claim that he deserved it for what he'd done to her friend, Sean. Like, I get that she's angry about the fact that he'd assaulted Sean. He should absolutely have got into trouble for that. Should have got a criminal conviction for that. But hey, we're talking about a whole different universe of damage from what he did to Sean compared to what she's done to him. Sicklingly as well, she repeats this whole thing about coming with every stroke of the pickaxe. So again, sexualizing the murder. And she then goes and apparently gives Doug Jerry's wallet. Now, according to Doug, he just burned the contents and threw the wallet away. He's probably terrified that he's somehow implicated in this crime. Now, both Doug and Libram, they've both been absolutely horrified and shocked and terrified and disgusted by what Tucker and Garrett had done. However, initially they did assist the perpetrators. So following the crime happening, Libran helped Garrett abandon Jerry's pickup later the same day in a parking lot and Ronnie Carey's ex helped them dispose of it. So he actually removed the serial number from the stolen bike and Doug let them store some of Jerry's motorcycle parts in his garage, although apparently later he threw them into the Brazos River. So the fact that they aren't going straight to the police is problematic because they are actually being accessories to the crime. And even the fact that they're handling stolen goods, that's all indicative of criminal behavior. Now, as you will already have gathered from what I've told you about Tucker and Garrett, they're not exactly the most confidential individuals. They have that superiority and arrogance that certain criminals have, where they just think they can speak out loud what they've done and brag about it with no repercussions. So basically, after telling Doug, Tucker then tells her sister Carrie. Again, she repeats this horrible sexual connection of orgasming with every blow of a pickaxe, which... Even if it were true, I would suggest keeping it quiet. Keep it quiet. It's very odd behavior. Read the room. Not many people are ever going to want to hear that stuff. It's odd. It makes you seem like a monster, a weird sexual deviant monster. Just throwing it out there. Anyway, she's telling her sister, she's going into the detail. She even gave Carrie Deborah's wallet as a birthday present. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that a second-hand wallet of a dead woman who's been murdered is probably not high on the list of the kind of presents you'd wish to receive on your birthday. Got your present. Is that, is that somebody else's wallet? It is somebody else's wallet. Whose wallet? Ah, it's just somebody I murdered. Why are you giving me this as a present? I thought it was thoughtful. I'm just going to back away now. I'm going to back away leaving the wallet on the side, removing myself from any implication in this horrific crime. That kind of thing is how it plays out in my head. And actually for Carrie, that's what's going on in her head without a doubt. She's so disgusted by this that she throws it away. And then later on that day, she's probably trying to process this and hope that this isn't really playing out in the reality that she's been told it is happening, i.e. that her sister has gone ahead and done all these things. She's probably hoping, please God, just let this be my sister losing her mind a little bit and just making stuff up. But no, because later on that day, she's watching the local news with her sister and with Garrett and the report about the killings comes on. The reaction of Tucker and Garrett is they just start laughing and then they start bragging about the fact that they are the pickaxe murderers. They even brought Lieberant round to watch it. Now, even though Tucker was her sister, Carrie was really scared. So first of all, she realized that she knows about the murders and she knows what her sister and Garrett are capable of. They don't leave witnesses. And now she is a witness. And she'd also heard her sister talking to Garrett about killing Libran and Ronnie because she doesn't want them to go around telling anybody about the murders. Even though she's the one actually telling people about the murders, she's blaming the people who've heard it now and suggesting that a way of dealing with this is snuffing out their lives. 
And I think we can all agree, Tucker clearly now has a taste for killing. She'd actually talked to future criminal plans to undertake with Garrett and his friends. She wanted to raid drug labs, kill the people who work there, and then steal their property. So she's got this real malicious intent for the future. So her sister is thinking, you know what? Maybe I am expendable. So it's at this point that she's afraid for her life. So Carrie actually moves out of the property that she shared with Tucker and Garrett and moves in with her boyfriend, Doug. And it's soon after this happens that Doug contacts homicide detective J.C. Moisier and then tells him everything that they knew. So Tucker and Garrett, they get arrested. They get charged with Jerry's murder. And as it's been committed during the course of a robbery, it makes it a capital offence. Now Tucker is also charged with Deborah's murder. And that meant if found guilty, they would face the death penalty. Now, despite the fact that they have recorded confessions and physical evidence against them, they both decide to plead not guilty to the charges against them. I mean, for the love of God, what were they expecting to happen? That somehow people would be like, oh, you know, you went around telling everybody how you played out this crime. You literally bragged about it on tape. We have that tape. You even gave items belonging to the people you murdered to family members. But sure, go not guilty, no problem. No one's gonna have an issue and I'm sure that they'll let you off. But this is what they do, they plead not guilty. We see this all the time, don't we? That arrogance, superiority, belief that somehow they can outsmart the system. So at Garrett and Tucker's trials, what happens is Libran agrees to testify for the state. Bear in mind, he had been an eyewitness to part of the murders. Now, he wasn't actually offered any kind of deal. He wasn't given any sort of leniency in return for his testimony. All that was agreed was that his cooperation would be made known at the court at his own trial. So even though there wasn't a plea deal, what they would say is this person did help to testify and put these very bad people away. Now, Garrett... They refused to testify in Tucker's trial. But Tucker didn't do the same for him because Tucker did agree to testify at Garrett's. And that was in return for Deborah's murder charge to be dropped. So essentially, that's how she managed to manipulate that system. With respect, I don't think that Deborah's murder charge should have been dropped because at the end of the day, she was a woman of worth and great meaning and her murder should have been acknowledged and accepted and charged in the way that it should have been because otherwise it's disrespectful to that particular victim. Now, Tucker was without a doubt heavily intoxicated with drink and drugs when she carried out the killings. However, according to the law, this would only have been a mitigating factor at her trial had it caused her to go into a state of temporary insanity. It was found that this wasn't the case. So even though she was intoxicated, the thing that really stood out was that Tucker gained sexual gratification and satisfaction from the experience. Now, because of that, that's evidence of a very highly sadistic nature. The psychiatric evaluation that was done on her actually referred to her behaviours as a most dangerous aberration of character. So it doesn't wash that she was temporarily insane, that she'd lost her mind. It just isn't in keeping with what they find out. And also, just from the description of how she was during and after, she was certainly compass mentor. She enjoyed the killings. We get to the 19th of April, 1984. Tucker's found guilty of capital murder, and a week later, she's sentenced to death by lethal injection. On the 18th of December, 1984, she's received onto death row at the Mountain View unit, Gatesville, Texas. And actually, she would remain there for more than 13 years, while she literally exhausted every appeal in a bid to get the sentence commuted. She worked really hard because she really didn't want to die. Now, her boyfriend and her accomplice, Daniel Ryan Garrett, he was also found guilty of capital murder. However, he actually died of liver disease in June 1993. He was actually waiting a retrial at that time. Not sure why. He was a cold-blooded killer. 
I don't think a retrial would have given any different result. But he died anyway. Now, there's no denying under any circumstance or any universe in all universes that Tugger had definitely committed a hideous crime, which, according to the letter of law, justified the death penalty. However, and I said, you may feel a little bit conflicted towards the end of this, and I mean it, you may, because during her incarceration, public opinion started to shift. People started to soften towards her. So free from living a life full of dysfunction and drugs and having a very structured prison regime, her character starts to transform. So first of all, she begins to express what's considered real genuine remorse for her actions. And she has this real warm, outgoing nature. And that meant that she was somebody that people really liked. She started to make really good friends. And then apparently, she finds God. And she became a born again Christian in October 1983. So just four months after the killings, and just pretty soon after she was initially incarcerated, she started to read the Bible. And then one day, she has this epiphany, this spiritual awakening. And she claims that she suddenly found herself on the cell floor and she's just begging God for forgiveness. And she actually later went on to marry Reverend Dana Brown. So they meet during his prison ministry and they were married by proxy in 1995. So Tucker wouldn't actually have been present at the marriage because she was on death row. Also, the reports are that she was basically a model prisoner. The disciplinary record that she had was virtually spotless. Those who interacted with her, they said that she was literally a completely different person to the one who'd committed those heinous crimes that I've described. And she was really popular with lots of other inmates. And she was so popular on a community level, as far as people from the outside looking in were concerned, she'd reformed to such a degree that 18 men asked if they could take place on the gurney so that she could be saved. Genuinely. People were electing to be executed in her place. And she did ask, and many did ask, for her to have clemency, to have the death sentence commuted to one of life imprisonment with no chance of parole. So she wasn't asking to ever be freed, but she was asking for the opportunity to spend her life being useful because in the prison system, she was so popular and she was so helpful and she was so good with the other prisoners that there was a potential she could help rehabilitate them. She took her, went and administered to inmates who were as lost as she was. She tried to warn other young people about the dangers of the lifestyle that she'd experienced. So she really did go out of her way to try to help as many other inmates as possible. And essentially her argument was, dead, I'm useless, you'll get your retribution, I won't be here anymore, but you will fail to actually utilise the change that can be so inspiring to others. If you take my life, my life won't have any meaning anymore and my life won't have worth to all of the individuals that I'm actually here and able to help. So as her execution date grows nearer, people really start calling out for clemency. It comes from all directions, including Pope John Paul II. Even he's like, just give her clemency. Give her a life sentence. Don't kill her. Also the United Nations, the European Parliament, even Deborah's own brother. I mean, that is just incredible. Ron Carlson, the brother of Deborah, who was horrendously murdered. Even he is forgiving enough to ask for clemency. But others, they said, you know what? You wouldn't be receiving the same kind of sympathy if you were a man. And people really felt that. They felt that there were lots of examples of men who had done pretty incredible things whilst they were serving time on death row and they were put to death. And they didn't feel it would be fair just because she was female to be seen as this nurturing and empathic person who changed. They didn't feel it would be fair to show her clemency. I don't know how any of you feel. I think it's one of those where it leaves many people divided. 
So Tucker's impending execution, it just caused this media frenzy. Part of that is to do with her gender. Partly it's to do with the conversion to Christianity. And part of it as well will have been to do with the fact that she was an attractive woman. So as the date draws closer, there were literally nightly reports and nightly interviews about this. There was live nationwide coverage from the prison. So we get to the 3rd of February, 1998. This is the day of execution. The Supreme Court rejected two requests to halt the execution. And the Texas governor, George W. Bush, refused to grant a one-time 30-day reprieve. He stated that she committed the crime and the role of the state was to enforce the law. In one of the many letters that she actually wrote to him, Tucker stated this, I feel the pain of that night and I feel the pain that goes on every day with others because of what I did that night. I know the evil that was in me then and I know what took place that night was so horrible that only a monster could do it. If you decide that you must carry out this execution, do it based solely on the brutality and heinousness of my crime. But please don't do it based on me being a future threat to society. I believe I am a positive contributor to our society and to helping others. What you're going to do is you're going to cut down on the recidivism rate. If you want to talk about crime, cutting down on crime, you'll cut down on the re recidivism rate. You will make your society a safer place because if, if God is literally living in somebody and their life is governed by his, his law, by his love and his morals, when they walk out of here, they're not going to be a threat to our society. Now, Tucker had previously stated in an interview that she'd actually made peace with her death, that she felt that she was ready to face that. She'd made peace with God. She also said that she no longer blamed her mother or society for her actions, that she'd taken responsibility and she recognised that she'd had choices and made those choices and they'd resulted where she was. For her last meal, she had a banana, a peach and a garden salad with ranch dressing. And allegedly, she skipped down the corridor to the execution chamber. She was so convinced that she was going to a better place. She wasn't afraid. She just felt this was God's choice and that she was going to peacefully and to some degree joyfully accept that. Carla Faye took her. She was injected by lethal injection shortly before 6.40 p.m. on the 3rd of February 1998 at Huntsville Prison in Texas. She was 38 years old. When asked if she had a final statement, she smiled and she responded, Yes, sir. I would like to say to all of you, the Thornton family and Jerry Dean's family, that I am so sorry. I hope God will give you peace with this. She looked at her husband, baby, I love you. She looked at Ronald Carlson, Deborah's brother. Ron, give Peggy a hug from me. She looked at everyone present, weeping and smiling. She said, everyone has been so good to me. I love all of you very much. I'm going to be face to face with Jesus now. Warden Baggett, thank all of you so much. You've all been so good for me. I love you all so very much. I'll see you when you get there. I will wait for you. According to the witnesses, as lethal injection administered, she praised Jesus, licked her lips, looked up at the ceiling and hummed. She gave two gasps and groaned as it took effect. Her sister Carrie shouted out, I love you, Carla. She was declared dead at 6.45 p.m. It took her eight minutes to die. Among the witnesses at her execution was Richard Thornton, that was Deborah's husband, along with their daughter and her son from a previous marriage. No witnesses representing Jerry's family were present. But those who were there were conflicted. It's as simple as that. Some really didn't believe that she should be killed. Some will have found peace that she was indeed put to death. Tucker was the first woman to be executed in Texas since 1863 and only the second woman 
to be executed in the US since the reinstatement of the death penalty in 1976. Now, since then, four more women have been executed in Texas. During the exact same time period, 578 men have been executed in the state. Massive, massive difference between male and females being put to death. Now, following Tucker's death, the captain of the death house team at Huntsville Prison, they actually resigned, even gave up his pension. He claimed that her execution made him change his stance on capital punishment. He didn't feel it was the right thing to do. Now, whether you do agree or don't agree with capital punishment, I think this case really just raised some important questions about the function of the criminal justice system. Certainly in the UK where I come from, the aims to reform and to rehabilitate. Now, whether or not this is achieved is another question, the answer to which is no, it isn't achieved. Because my God, the figures are depressing greeding, to say the least. So more than a quarter of offenders who are released from prison in England and Wales just go on to reoffend again, whilst adults released from custodial sentences of less than 12 months have a reoffending rate of 57.5%. Not exactly good statistics. So it's kind of ironic, in a way, that Tucker was actually a rare success story in a prison system. I mean, she literally completely reformed. She could have repaid her debt to society by continuing to provide something positive. However, the nature of her crime and the subsequent sentence prevented this because the death penalty essentially allows absolutely no opportunity for reform and rehabilitation. What was going through my mind, um, that I was losing a wife and that we were losing someone that was precious to the human race and someone that, that had been so productive in other people's lives uh, from a six by nine cell. And uh, some of the things that you're gonna be hearing, I mean, uh, we had, her attorneys, which have been fantastic, uh, have, um, you know, we had even sent in uh, a waiver for, uh, to waive her right to parole and uh, to do life. Uh, she was that strong about it herself, Carla. And so, um, you know, I think we need to move in the direction that, uh, uh, where we can, you know, we can help people and people can be helped. And Carla's even sat down, you know, she sat down, talk to some of the people and I think you'll be hearing about this in the future and, uh, about some of the things that she recommended to officials in, in up in TDCJ that uh, would be beneficial to inmates all across this state and how to deal with them on a rehabilitative base and uh, and first and foremost we know that that would come through the chaplaincy department but there's other ways you know uh, her first and foremost obviously would be through spiritual well-being. Now that said Tucker did the crime so even though she can be seen to be somebody who has tried to reform, the reality is that she had victims whose lives were ended. You know, whilst it's easy to feel some sympathy for her because she did have an amazing transformation, according to those who knew her, the true victims in this case were Jerry Dean and Deborah Thornton and their family and their friends. And furthermore, Many have actually argued that people only saw the humanity in Tucker because she was attractive and articulate. Because we don't tend to see humanity in others who are less fortunate than that. You know, there are many examples of people who don't fit those paradigms I've just described, who nobody has any sympathy for whatsoever. And I suppose as a final note, and maybe this is me being like uber cynical, maybe this is me not necessarily being able to fully lean into the beliefs of those who didn't want her to die, but I guess there always is the possibility that Tucker was just a full-blown psychopath. She was just somebody who everyone was fooled by. Just an incredibly convincing act of reformation. Now, I think that's unlikely, but let's be honest, you never know. Now, following Tucker's death, her ex-husband told reporters this. She always said that someday she would be famous, and in the months leading up to her execution, she finally achieved that fame. But wow, guys, fame at such a cost. That's got to be the definition there, hasn't it? I don't know how you feel. 
about this case? Do you believe that Carla Tucker should indeed have been put to death? Or do you believe that her actions after going to prison should have essentially reduced that sentence from death to a life without parole? I would love to hear your thoughts on it. I would love to hear whether you are team Carla and commuting that sentence or indeed team victim and you feel that she absolutely should and rightfully should have been put to death. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Join me again next time for another true crime with me, Emma Kenny. See you again soon, guys. Take care. Be safe.